Hello everyone, the Coordinating Center for the National Drug Early Warning System, sponsored by the National Institute on Drug Abuse, is very pleased to welcome you to part one of our two-part End Use Presents webinar series on illicit stimulants. The End Use PI is Dr. Eric Wish and our NIDA project scientist is Moira O'Brien. I believe that both of them are in the audience with us this afternoon. My name is Erin Artijani, End Use Co-I, and Barbara Kerr, Marwa Al-Nasir, and I will be the facilitators for this webinar. We are part of the End Use Coordinating Center team based at CSER at the University of Maryland College Park. For those who are interested, you can find detailed information about End Use, recordings of prior webinars, and invitations to future webinars on our website at www.endus.org. You will also find instructions for how to join our End Use network and participate in ongoing discussions with approximately 1,400 experts and concerned citizens from across the United States and many other countries. We developed the Endus Presents webinars to work with leading substance abuse experts to explore emerging drugs and timely drug-related topics. Today, we are excited to be joined by four presenters addressing historical and current trends in the use of methamphetamine in the United States. Our first presenter will be Jim Hall, a drug abuse epidemiologist at the Center for Applied Research on Substance Use and Health Disparities at Nova Southeastern University. Jim will provide a national overview of stimulant use from 1880 to the present. He will be followed by three of our NDU Sentinel Community epidemiologists. Dr. Jane Maxwell, a research professor at the Addiction Research Institute at the University of Texas, Austin. Dr. Brian Dew, Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of Counseling and Psychological Services at Georgia State University, and Dr. Mary Lynn Brecht, Adjunct Professor and Research Statistician at the University of California, Los Angeles. They will each present on recent changes in methamphetamine trends in their end use sites. This webinar will be approximately 90 minutes long, and we encourage you to submit questions during and after the presentation. However, please do not raise your hand. Instead, we ask that you please post your questions in the Q&A box. And we will hold a Q&A session after our last presenter has completed her comments. Our presenters, Barbara Marwa and I, will do our best to get to all of your questions, and we will address any remaining questions after the webinar. A recording of this webinar and copies of our presenter's slides will all be made available on our website, which again is www.endus.org. So thank you for joining us today, and we hope that you enjoy the webinar. So Jim, I'll turn it over to you. And uh, thank you, and good afternoon. Uh, let's begin with a uh, overview of the history of uh, various stimulant outbreaks in the United States. Going back to the late 19th century with the, the first uh, real cocaine epidemic uh, in America, uh, lasting into the early years of the 20th century, followed by uh, the introduction of pharmaceutical stimulants uh, just about at the beginning of the Depression and uh, moving heavily used uh, through World War II um, and then in the decades uh, after the war. Uh, before they were then brought under to stricter regulations and control uh, in the uh, about 1970 uh, and the uh, then introduction of illicit uh, clandestine produced uh, methamphetamine. These reoccurring patterns of uh, stimulant epidemics uh, really go from 1880 to the present day. And the secular nature of the epidemics I refer to as the cycles of speed uh, as we see the waxing and waning of different uh, substance use disorder patterns uh, over those years. The next uh, series of slides are a few timelines uh, that uh, basically track the uh, key years of um, significant misuse of the various stimulants, uh, beginning with cocaine. Uh, and we have the first uh, epidemic breaking out about 1880 uh, and going for about 40 years until uh, 1920. Uh, and then uh, we have a very, uh, about 50 years of uh, relatively low cocaine use until its reemergence in the mid 1970s. And uh, as it's been around uh, ever since uh, with uh, peaks and valleys 
uh, in the trends with the most recent uh, years showing uh, the most significant growth uh, in cocaine availability as well as consequences. Uh, these uh, timelines are not based on any quantitative uh, measure of uh, historical data because that data simply does not exist, but rather they are just impressions based upon a social history as well as medical history of the time. And uh, much of the work of uh, Dr. David Musto, uh, the uh, eminent uh, medical historian uh, from Yale University, uh, who uh, tragically passed away in 2010. The uh, decline of the cocaine epidemic uh, saw the arrival of uh, pharmaceutical stimulants uh, beginning uh, in the 1920s and uh, going uh, well uh, into uh, the uh, middle of the 20th century. Uh, and then rising again uh, uh, significantly with uh, abuse of attention deficit disorder uh, stimulants uh, in more recent years. Uh, the decline in 1970 is uh, based on uh, strict uh, pharmaceutical regulations implied at that time uh, that uh, dramatically cut the availability of pharmaceutical stimulants. Then, uh, as they were brought under restricted use, uh, the arrival of clandestine produced illicit methamphetamine takes on the scene in the 1960s and uh, dramatically increases in the 70s as pharmaceutical stimulants become harder to obtain. So we had the first methamphetamine epidemic going from 1970 to about 1995, and uh, then uh, re-emerging in more recent years, uh, uh, as we've seen uh, dramatic increases and in at the highest peaks level uh, of reported methamphetamine availability, as well as its purity, uh, and at about the lowest price that's uh, ever been seen. Um, so that's an overview of our various uh, reoccurring patterns of stimulant epidemics that we'll put all on this one uh, graphic exposure showing uh, first uh, the cocaine epidemics in uh, the bright red uh, graphic, uh, with uh, pharmaceutical stimulants coming to fill the void as cocaine wanes off about the beginning of the depression uh, and then through the Second World War as well as the decades following that. Um, and then finally, illicit methamphetamine arriving as pharmaceutical stimulants are brought under to stricter control and regulation in about 1970. Uh, and as we look at these three epidemic patterns together, uh, we see that uh, at the current time, we are at among the highest levels that we've seen for all three of this category of stimulants. Uh, we'll look more in detail on the cocaine early years and the early epidemics with cocaine in our next NDUS webinar, which will be part two of this series uh, on stimulant uh, epidemics. Uh, and that uh, NDUS webinar will be on April 16th, so we'll reserve the discussion of the early cocaine uh, years uh, until uh, next month. But uh, as we mentioned, uh, pharmaceutical stimulants uh, are introduced uh, in uh, the 20th century after being uh, first produced as pharmaceutical amphetamine in 1887 uh, in Germany. Then in 1919, uh, Japan makes a more powerful version of uh, the amphetamine, which basically is the introduction of methamphetamine at that time. And then from 1929 uh, to 1945, we see the first U.S. epidemic uh, uh, generated by pharmaceutical industry as well as medical professionals. Um, in 1933, Smith, Klein, and French uh, patents uh, amphetamine and markets it as a benzodrine inhaler, which contained 325 milligrams of an oily amphetamine base soaked into a cotton swab inside a small tube to inhale as a uh, decongestant. Uh, this uh, amphetamine uh, product, however, was sold over the counter from 1933 for 15 years until 1948, and was among the most common forms of methamphetamine for non-medical use. 
In 1937, the American Medical Association gave its seal of approval that benzodrine sulfate amphetamine tablets could be marketed for the indications of uh, narcolepsy or Parkinsonianism as well as being uh, a minor depression, uh, depressant, antidepressant, uh, and therefore was among the really first pharmaceutical antidepressants introduced on the market. The American Medical Association seal of approval was basically a seal allowing for the advertising of pharmaceutical products, which was determined by a committee of the American Medical Association uh, before the FDA had in its labeling regulations specific indications for all medications in the US. Um, the seal of approval allowed for the advertising of pharmaceutical products to healthcare prescribers and physicians uh, basically through only medical journals, not like the massive marketing campaigns we see today for pharmaceuticals. But the first uh, antidepressant was actually uh, amphetamine tablets. And as the ad from the 1940s in JAMA shows, uh, if the individual is depressed, simply prescribe Benny's, or the street name for benzodrine uh, sulfate. During World War II, the US and British military were supplied with five milligram tablets of benzodrine uh, throughout the war. And in Germany and Japan, uh, they supplied their military forces with methamphetamine. So much of World War II was uh, on a strong out stimulant binge. Um, and uh, in uh, the uh, Second World War during that time period, back in the United States, we saw a dramatic increase in the use of amphetamines for weight loss. Um, not as an approved uh, indication at that time, but uh, introduced by off-brand manufacturers of amphetamines, starting their own community weight loss clinics, where they then dispense their amphetamine medications. And in 1945, uh, there was supposedly enough of supply of uh, amphetamines in the uh, pharmaceutical market to uh, keep a, a half million Americans with two uh, amphetamine tablets daily for the entire year. And uh, the uh, benzodrine inhalers were primarily abused by either eating or simply chewing on the cotton swab in the inhaler. And uh, benzodrine abuse uh, was significantly multiplied uh, many times by its exposure at, during the military years of using it uh, during the war years uh, became a reason why people continue to use benzodrine um, as a stimulant uh, of abuse. During the Second World War, American and British troops also consumed large amounts of dexedrine, which is the brand name for dextroamphetamine. As well, the Japanese too developed their own military grade amphetamine, which was more of the methamphetamine style. And after the war ended, a large stockpile of the drug flooded Japan streets. Uh, leading to a major injecting drug use epidemic in Japan in the 1950s, which was uh, followed by a major military and law enforcement crackdown on methamphetamine abuse uh, in that country. And that also uh, a strong enforcement led uh, to the spread of methamphetamine, both production and use uh, to other parts of Asia and specifically uh, to the Philippines. As World War II neared its conclusion, a request was sent from the Nazi high command for a drug that would boost morale as well as fighting ability. And the German scientists responded with a new pill, which they called D9. And D9 was to contain equal parts, basically five milligrams each of cocaine, as well as an oxycodone-like painkiller as well as three milligrams of methamphetamine in the German pharmaceutical product Previtin, which was a methamphetamine uh, sold uh, in Germany uh, in the Nazi era. But the war ended before uh, 
the new D9 medication uh, could reach the general military population. By the end of World War II in 1945, uh, less than a decade after amphetamine tablets were introduced to medical community, over a half million citizens are, were using the drug either psychiatrically uh, or for weight loss. And that's just within the first 10 years of its being a pharmaceutical product. Yet, as often occurs in the first flush of enthusiasm for new pharmaceuticals, both the abuse as well as adverse effects and other drawbacks had not yet attracted uh, much notice. In 1949, the American Medical Association Committee approved uh, the use of amphetamines uh, as an approved indication uh, being for weight loss and therefore could be advertised uh, in that. In 1952, the Food and Drug Administration uh, estimated that the production of amphetamine and methamphetamine salts were nearly four times the amount that they had been just three years before in 1949. So with the beginning of the 50s and during the period of the Korean War, we see a real uh, turning to amphetamine use, particularly for weight loss, as well as uh, being uh, psychiatric antidepressants. Then in 1950, uh, Smith, Klein, and French uh, introduced uh, Dexamil, uh, which is a dextroamphetamine plus uh, aminobarbital. Uh, this was for mental and emotional distress as well as a weight loss uh, remedy. So uh, the new decade also brought a, a whole new category of widely prescribed uh, dextroamphetamine for, for uh, weight loss as well. In the early 1960s, amphetamines were consumed at higher rates than tranquilizers were. Uh, the largest age group among medical users at that time were those aged between 36 and 45 years, and 85% of all amphetamine patients in the 1950s were women. As is illustrated in this ad, that in the 1950s, competition among pharmaceutical firms boosted amphetamine consumption dramatically, uh, and the competitive pharmaceutical manufacturers uh, arrived after the expiration of the Smith, Klein, and French patent in 1949. As this ad from the 1950s JAMA uh, states, uh, in mild psychogenic depressive states, this is the result in minutes, cheerfulness, mental alertness, and optimism with rafetamine phosphate, a uh, weight loss product as well as antidepressant uh, prescribed in the 1950s. Evidence emerging around 1960 that amphetamine is truly addictive instead of merely habituating like caffeine as leading pharmacologists had asserted when the drug was first introduced. Not unlike the parallels we see in the pharmaceutical industry with the introduction of uh, powerful opioids in the 1990s. In 1970, nearly 10 million Americans were past year users of amphetamines. And in that same year, 80 to 90% of amphetamines seized on the streets in the United States were pills manufactured by US pharmaceutical firms. And in the United States, medical amphetamine use declined only after 1970, when new laws restricting prescribes, prescribing uh, went into effect. In early 1970s, the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs, or the BNDD, which is the forerunner of the US Drug Enforcement Administration, moved all amphetamine products to Schedule II, including methylphenidate or Ritalin, as well as phenmetrazine or preludin. Prescription sales of amphetamines and related drugs actually shot up dramatically when the new restrictions were announced, but then plummeted 60% below their original level when they the restrictions actually went into effect. And only narcolepsy and, quote, hyperkinetic disorder of childhood 
what is today called attention deficit disorder, but was then rarely diagnosed. Uh, the only narcolepsy and hyperkinetic disorder for childhood remained approved usages of pharmaceutical amphetamines in the 1970s. In 1963, the first clandestine methamphetamine lab was seized in the United States. And through the 1960s, we saw increasing occurrences of methamphetamine uh, of intentional uh, misuse and abuse. Um, and as previously mentioned, uh, methamphetamine was first uh, developed or uh, crystallized uh, from ephedrine using iodine and red phosphorus uh, in Japan. And methamphetamine was actually easier to make than amphetamine and turned out to be more potent uh, a substance. Then Nazi leaders distributed millions of doses of methamphetamine in tablets that we previously mentioned that were called provitin uh, to their infantry, sailors, and airmen in World War II. So in the early 1930s, the Nazis introduced uh, provitin as a military uh, medication. And then by 1938, Provitin was first sold to the German public over the counter and became quite popular. So methamphetamine was distributed uh, throughout uh, the uh, German war years. Uh, when supplies ran low on the war front, uh, soldiers would merely write to their families back home uh, requesting shipments of speed. Hitler himself uh, is reported to have consumed vast quantities of drugs during the war, including cocaine, as well as an early version of oxycodone, as well as crystal methamphetamine. Stimulants went a long way uh, toward the Nazi dream of creating uh, super soldiers. Methamphetamine gained a lot of attention uh, after the 1969 Rolling Stones concert at Altima Springs, California. This was shortly after about two years following the Summer of Love in San Francisco. And the Rolling Stones had uh, hired the Hells Angels as security guards uh, for this particular concert. Uh, the only problem was that Hells Angels showed up loaded on drugs as well as cheap red wine and totally out of control. It led to riots uh, as people stormed the stage and there were a few deaths associated with it. And from this concert emerged perhaps the first and maybe the most uh, useful and effective harm reduction message uh, of the 20th century. And that was simply the two words that speed kills. So out of this single event, uh, methamphetamine particularly received uh, a, a a dangerous drug label uh, that was effective message uh, to already known drug users to uh, hopefully prevent their initiation of meth use. In the 1990s and the early 2000s, meth made from pseudoephedrine, uh, the decongestant in drugstore products like Sudafed, poured out of domestic labs like those in the early uh, seasons of Breaking Bad. Narcotic squads became glorified hazmat teams. And the most news about methamphetamine was an explosion in a local lab in the neighborhood, uh, or a fire, uh, or actually a toxic poisoning of people living in houses where meth labs were set up. Um, but the clandestine labs of the domestically produced methamphetamine were among the most notable uh, news uh, articles about uh, the drug at that time period. Um, and in the 20th century, methamphetamine is primarily a local thing in that most of the methamphetamine consumed in the 20th century was produced uh, near to where it was actually cooked or, or, or made up. So it was a relative series of local epidemics rather than ever a single national uh, amphetamine epidemic in uh, the latter 20th century. The earliest communities impacted by meth actually included Philadelphia and Minneapolis in the 1970s. And then through the 1980s uh, along the West Coast from Portland 
down Highway 101 to San Francisco, uh, San Diego, Los Angeles, uh, throughout Texas and, uh, and, and the infamous Hawaiian ice or crystallized methamphetamine that appeared in the late 1980s, 1989 to 1990. Uh, and as from Philippine sources, of uh, a recrystallized methamphetamine that was used for vaporizing and, and smoking uh, that became a, a very serious epidemic in the islands uh, in uh, the early 1980s. And then as the second half of the 1990s and uh, the first half of the 20th of 2000 decade, um, Arizona as well as rural areas in the U.S. South and the East and particularly in the Southwest were most impacted. In 2005, Congress passed the Combat Methamphetamine Act. And this is what put pseudoephedrine behind the counter in pharmacies. And although some meth makers tried smurfing, uh, meth cases has plummeted dramatically with the passage of the pseudoephedrine control. Smurfers were users of methamphetamine who cooks would send out to purchase uh, pseudoephedrine in limited quantities from multiple uh, outlets or retail pharmacies, and then bring that pseudoephedrine back to the cooker uh, and would who would share uh, some of the methamphetamine that he made with those smurfers who had supplied the pseudoephedrine. But with no more meth lab explosions on the nightly news, uh, the public uh, soon forgot about the drug, uh, particularly as the opioid epidemic took over the headlines and much of the attention of the substance use disorder world. Uh, but Mexican drug cartels stepped in with improving production using the P2P method that yielded higher potency, as well as the lowest cost methamphetamine that we'd ever seen, now averaging around $2,000 per pound. Uh, Dr. Maxwell is going to give us more information on this shifting of the method, and particularly the use of the P2P method in the Mexican labs, and how that has resulted in a dramatic increase in potency and availability of Mexican methamphetamine in recent years. This graph tracks the number of high intensity drug trafficking area uh, or the HIDA groups, uh, national threat assessment data on uh, methamphetamine seizures in the United States, rising from 7,500 um, kilograms in uh, 2011 uh, to uh, nearly 29,000 kilograms by 2017, a dramatic increase in the supply and availability of this high potency, particularly Mexican methamphetamine. And this map shows the locations of those seizures. The larger the circle, the greater the amount seized, but we see that now we've moved from a series of local epidemics to truly uh, an epidemic of methamphetamine abuse that covers um, most all of the country. Um, and uh, this is a, a rather dramatic picture of where methamphetamine uh, is seen today in the United States. Uh, meth seizures, however, still remain primarily along the southwest border. As we see here in 2016, uh, the major port of entry was the border crossing at San Diego, where more than uh, 20,000 pounds of methamphetamine were seized. Uh, followed next by uh, Laredo, Texas, and Tucson, Arizona, as well as then uh, entries from other U.S. areas. And as we'll hear uh, just shortly uh, from Dr. Drew, uh, how uh, the Atlanta area became kind of a key distribution point of Mexican methamphetamine, uh, particularly for the eastern United States. In 2017, approximately 774,000 people aged 12 and above were considered current users of methamphetamine as reported by the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. 
This represents three tenths of a percent of the population of the United States, age 12 and older, with the highest uh, age group uh, showing methamphetamine recent use was uh, for those 18 to 25 years of age, with four tenths of a percent of that population reporting a current, which is in the past 30 days use of methamphetamine 30 days prior to taking uh, the survey. This graph shows in the blue bars on the bottom, the significant rise in psychostimulant deaths in the United States in recent years. Most of these deaths are methamphetamine, rising from 1,378 deaths in 2007 to well over 10,300 in 2017. And the small thin line, green line on the graph shows what percentage of those deaths in the blue bars were also found with an opioid present in the decedent at the time of death. Now, whether this was from contaminated uh, methamphetamine, contaminated with fentanyl analogs or other opioid analogs, or whether it reflects a pattern of uh, simultaneous or uh, continual sequential use of uh, stimulants with depressants, or the opioid, uh, and then in a binge pattern uh, with uh, uh, methamphetamine. Um, really remains to be seen, but we do have evidence of fent fentanyl contaminated uh, methamphetamine uh, from the DEA, and we'll be looking more at that uh, as the future months uh, proceed ahead. Uh, this final graph uh, just summarizes what we've already seen. The blue line is the dramatic increase in supply and availability of seized methamphetamine from 2011 to 2017. While the orange line uh, on the graph with the right hand uh, in the, uh, axis of the graph showing uh, the rise in deaths related to methamphetamine. So we see those paralleling increases uh, through the recent uh, six year history. So that methamphetamine today, uh, the market is literally inundated with so much pure, low cost meth that dealers have more of it than they know what to do with. In 2018, the United States border agents seized 10 to 20 times the amount of methamphetamine that they seized just a decade ago. And methamphetamine experts say has never been purer, cheaper, or more lethal. And particularly as we move into finding uh, co-occurring use with opioids and stimulants, uh, and also the question of fentanyl contaminated meth or cocaine uh, in more recent years uh, remains uh, questions for further investigation. We'll now move into our three uh, sentinel site reports from the National Drug and Early, and Early Warning System. And we'll begin in Texas uh, with Dr. Uh, Jane Maxwell. Dr. Maxwell? Thank you, Jim. And let's talk about meth a little bit. Um, I put this up simply um, to get some numbers out here that you can come back later, because I keep hearing arguments, meth is a bigger problem, no heroin's a bigger problem, no cocaine is a bigger problem. And depending on which data set, you get some differences as to how many people died of heroin versus how many died of meth or cocaine. So this is just for references for your purposes to show what's going on nationally in the, the latest data. And these are the indicators in Texas. I have more poison control center calls for meth than for heroin or cocaine, have slightly more cocaine deaths than for meth, more treatment admissions for meth and more tox lab exhibits. This is a national forensic laboratory information system. And I think it weighs, weighs in slightly differently because it doesn't mean you have to be arrested and a drug taken off of you to be identified. 
if there's a fight down at the bar on 6th Street and people are dropping drugs, they're going to pick them up and send them to the lab. Likewise, if you go into a household where it's neglected children and you find meth, it's going to get picked up and identified. So I think it's a good indication of just how prevalent meth is out there, whether or not it's resulted in an arrest. Looked at the top 20 drugs, 25 drugs in each U.S. region. Clearly more meth in the West. Heroin, slightly more in the Northeast than the West. Fentanyl, alprazolam. Cocaine, again in the North. And we need to be watching cocaine with heroin in the North. And then cannabis. So different pictures depending on which region you're looking at. These are the results of the Combat Meth Act passed in 2005. The green bar, well, let's see, the green bars are 2006. And you can see how the flex point drops after that for each of the different indicators. It really drops and then it heads right back up again. And the numbers are now lower or higher than they have ever been. But it's a good indication of the what limiting the ability to buy pseudoephedrine ha did for a couple of years. This is from the methamphetamine profiling program, and let's talk about it for a minute. You can see that the production of pseudoephedrine has almost totally disappeared. Uh, you should be able to go on the DEA website and look at the number of meth labs. Can't do that now. Uh, the number of phenyl 2 propanol uh, production, well over 90%. Purity is pure and pure, which means uh, no dirt, no dirt, um, no whatever in the product, pure meth. And the potency, and when we talk about potency, Methamphetamine has two isomers, the L isomer and the D isomer. The L isomer is inert. It's like the Vicks inhaler that would dry up your stuffy nose. The D isomer is the one that has the psycho uh, potential, the effects you like for it. And you can see the potency now is about as high for purity as potency. So we're getting, as Jim said, more and more potent meth. And in looking in Texas, finding more meth seizures on highways through Austin, and the size is increasing. Look at the difference between May of last year and February of this year. And this is little old ladies driving cars very slowly up the interstate highway heading to Minneapolis. And they got stopped, and they had that amount in their car. On the border, on the routes coming into Austin, we had a thousand five pounds of bell peppers, and then two weeks later, 906 pounds of strawberries. What's going on? They know that if they pull trucks with perishable goods, if they don't find it very quickly and the goods start going bad, the government has to pay. So the um, Distributors very much like to send through bell peppers and strawberries, but the size of these shipments. Also, meth can be brought in from Mexico as a powder or dissolved in water. And then after it gets across, they can take it to a dry house and convert it back to crystal. Uh, much easier to smoke, to smuggle if it's in some kind of a container in the car that looks like a gasoline uh, can or, or something. And speedballing is back. I don't think it's as much contaminated fentanyl as combining meth or cocaine with fentanyl or tramadol to take the edge off the meth effect. This is the old speedball. You can only do so much meth before your body can't stand it, and fentanyl would be a very quick way to come down from it. Also, I'm very concerned about more meth use among men having sex with other men, particularly the black and Hispanic populations, 
and high-risk heterosexual populations. A couple of days, days ago, Dr. Redfield and um, one of the other doctors at CDC talked about a campaign to do something about this high-risk use, use by these young men. And this is the Texas death data in which of the stimulants, and this was, they found methamphetamine. <clears throat> they also found some tramadol. They also found some fentanyl. But look, for the psychostimulants, <clears throat> excuse me, and cocaine, more use of the downers to come down from those runs. Then a, third, a second pattern of mixing in uh, fentanyl or tramadol with benzos or heroin or other opiates. So I wonder, are we having two developing groups, the stimulant users who are using speed balls to come down, or another group who are either into pain pills or opioids and adding in fentanyl and tramadol uh, to enhance the feeling? And I think we should be watching for tramadol. Tramadol is not as tightly scheduled. And these are the fentanyl items seized, and particularly since 2013. Look at the numbers going up. Um, so we need to watch tramadol. Uh, I did some sessions for adult protective service workers, and they were talking about the elderly patients who have been prescribed massive amounts of tramadol. So we need to watch that. HIV cases in Texas by mode of exposure. Um, more meth use among young men having sex with men. High risk heterosexuals, it was Fauci and Redfield in JAMA uh, two weeks ago, that say that the HIV, HIV epidemic in this country can be ended quickly by expanding access to antiretroviral treatments and PrEP. In 1987, 71% of the HIV cases were men having sex with men. We're back to 71% again. Now, in recent history, we've seen the first AIDS patient cured. That may not be the correct term. But yet, we've made no progress on exposures to HIV. And this is the Texas diagnosis by gender. And if you look, the light blue is white male in this 30 year period. 67% were exposed and were HIV positive in 1987. Now it's down to 17% of the white males. Hispanic males went from 11% to 69%. Black males, 15%, up now to 57%. We have a crisis, and I'm glad Fauci and Redfield have mentioned this. I think perhaps the White House is looking at it, but we need to do something about this population because we know that if they're on PrEP every day and use condoms, they're not going to be infected. So there's no excuse for this, these numbers to go up. Uh, PrEP is not cheap. We need to provide it just like we're providing uh, narco. narco uh, narcotic treatments. We also know there is no FDA approved medication for methamphetamine or for cocaine. Uh, contingency management and community reinforcement are the only effective interventions that exist. Uh, we need to be training our counselors on contingency management. There is a Brand new PLOS, PLOS uh, article is out talking about they're the most efficient and effective, but we have essentially no other kinds of treatment for methamphetamine or cocaine. And we need to at least make sure our counselors are well qualified to use these techniques. And is cocaine coming back? I'm jumping ahead of, of the, the next uh, indie show. I want to show you what's going on. This is coca cultivation in Colombia. It ebbs and flows, depended on gov their government's effects or our government's effects of spraying paraquat and other herbicides to kill off the crop. Uh, starting in 2016, the FARC 
rebels and the Colombian government signed a peace treaty, and you can see the numbers going up just since 2016. But also, um, overdose deaths are up. Look how high, they're almost double in two years. Poison center calls heading upward. This is treatment admissions, and they're beginning to head up. And this is the tox labs identification. So not only have we got methamphetamine with no effective treatment, cocaine's back. We've, I've done some work looking at cocaine. Uh, this is now a younger population. They're employed. Uh, they've had more schooling. They start off uh, snorting it. But over time, they're beginning to show up again as crack smokers. So we need to be prepared for that. And with that, I give you Brian Dew. Good afternoon. Um, I would like to say I'm from Atlanta. Um, I'm uh, broadcasting this from Atlanta, but I'm actually down in Costa Rica. So if you see a bird fly by my head, <laughs> you'll know what that's about. Um, but it's great to be here on this topic. I, uh, we um, with uh, Indus have talked for uh, several years about the need to address the, uh, the rise in methamphetamine indicators. So I'm really happy to see and be a part of uh, this particular webinar. Uh, go to the next slide, please. The um, Atlanta is a very unique metropolitan, metropolitan area when it comes to drug trends. Um, Jim uh, mentioned it earlier, um, but Atlanta is a, considered a primary distribution hub for uh, both cocaine and methamphetamine. Uh, as well as for marijuana. So the slide that you're looking at now is from the DEA, uh, looking at primary distribution centers across the country. So one of the things I would have you do right away is to take a look at how many of the red stop signs, which is the symbol for methamphetamine, do you see east of the Mississippi River? Uh, the answer to that question is only one. And Atlanta is the only primary distri distribution hub for methamphetamine east of the Mississippi River. And uh, our drug indicators for methamphetamine have always been very unique to any other um, East Coast uh, metropolitan area. And to keep that in mind, uh, that has to do for multiple reasons. One is that we love our stimulants in Atlanta, Metro Atlanta. Uh, we've always been uh, historically very high with cocaine. Um, but you will see here that we're also very unique in the, uh, the amount of methamphetamine that is being used here that is being stored in Atlanta or being distributed up and down the East Coast. Um, that has to do a lot with the other types of transportation systems. If you've ever flown through Atlanta Hartsfield, you'll know the, it's uh, one of the largest, uh, most populous uh, airports in the world. Uh, we have, we're very close to the coast, uh, which makes uh, for drug transportation in and out of our city very convenient. However, the most important drug distribution uh, system is our uh, interstate system. And so picking up on what uh, Jane was mentioning earlier, a lot of the, the predominant amount of the meth that's in our city is being driven in on Interstate 20, Interstate 10. Over the last eight to 10 years, we've seen a, a shift in the type of methamphetamine that is brought into our city. Historically, it was always brought in in crystal form, driven over the border or transferred over the border and then driven into our city. However, now we're seeing a uh, majority of the methamphetamine being brought into Atlanta uh, or in the suburbs of Atlanta in liquid form and then brought into converter labs and then converted into meth itself and then stored here, used here or distributed from Atlanta. If we go on to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, one of the, I, know, I apologize, this slide may not be um, as easy to read as some of these others, but what you'll see here is that um, these circles represent uh, the number of Mexican drug cartels which are dominating metropolitan uh, markets. So many of the cities that you'll see are symbols representing cities on this map have one color. Um, and so therefore one drug cartel controls drug trafficking in that particular city. And what you may or may not be able to see and that is that in Atlanta, you have a pie that is comprised of about six different drug cartels. When you think about drug distribution of methamphetamine in Atlanta, one of the primary reasons our 
drug prices are low and our supply, our uh, purity rates are high, which I'll mention in just a bit, is because we have very large drug cartels that are competing against each other in the city of Atlanta. If you could blow up that particular pie, you would see that we have five to six major drug cartels in Atlanta, which are responsible for our drug trafficking. That level of competition is having huge impacts on supply and demand of not only methamphetamine, but cocaine and marijuana in our city. Let's go on to the next slide, please. So here, you, uh, my colleagues have mentioned uh, NIFLIS data. This is National Forensic Laboratory Information System data. And um, you can see here that uh, some of the same patterns that we've been talking about are, hold very much true for Metro Atlanta, that we in 2005, excuse me, 2005 and 2006, we see the height of uh, drug indicators uh, for methamphetamine, uh, excuse me, for cocaine. Um, that has dropped off considerably over the years, um, but we do see a, a peak for methamphetamine in 2005 of around 5,000 seizures. However, if you look at 2017, for example, you will see the number for, uh, for methamphetamine has drastically increased. Um, our drug, our uh, treatment data for 2005, we averaged around 12 to 12.5% of all our primary, uh, primary uh, treatment admissions for methamphetamine reached an all-time high. Uh, you'll see shortly when I show you the slide on treatment data that those numbers have gone back up over 10% for the first time ever since 2005. So you'll, I'm going to compare some data for you as far as looking at some of the sociodemographics. One of the things that we've been able to do in Atlanta is conduct several research studies uh, from 2002 on that have looked uh, not only at epi, epi data, but also doing uh, focus groups with drug users, uh, meth users, um, and we can give you a, more of a, I think a well-rounded image of what these users look like. Atlanta, for example, if you ever heard the word TINA uh, descri uh, in describing the use of methamphetamine in 1994, um, the, that's where the, the name uh, was formed in the gay community within Metro Atlanta. In the 1900s, 1990s, we saw kind of a, two types of methamphetamine. One is the more traditional crank, which was locally produced in labs, uh, the purity rate of about 20 to 30 percent. And then starting in about 1993 to 1994, we started seeing an influx of Mexican ice into the city of Atlanta, primarily into the gay uh, MSM community. Um, and then it began to spread out into uh, non-MSM populations. On to the next slide, please. There you, um, as a slide, looking at primary uh, public treatment emissions by select drug. It, I have to note that in 2015 and 2016, uh, the state public health department uh, was changing over its reporting system for treatment. So therefore there is no treatment data available for Metro Atlanta for those two years. But you can see cocaine and crack as a strong uh, uh, decrease in percentages. Um, but look at methamphetamine on the right you will see, um, again, the rate of primary uh, meth emits over 10% for the first time since 2005. Go on to the next slide, please. I want to take a look at um, who uh, and what um, a user and the type of meth being used in the route of administration uh, looks like today compared to where we uh, were describing it in 2005 at the earliest peak of use. Uh, another way of looking at um, some epi data is to look at the number of crystal meth anonymous groups. In, uh, in 2005, we had 34 in the metro Atlanta area that were meeting weekly. That got down to about 13 meetings around uh, 2014. That now is up in the mid-20s in 2017 across metro Atlanta. I think it's one way of looking at the, uh, um, the uh, support systems. Uh, we've seen some changes in gender. Um, uh, it's become, uh, Atlanta had the highest percentage of female treatment emits in 2005 of any major U.S. city. Um, that's become more equal uh, in 2017, although females still outnumber males coming into treatment. Um, this is a big significant, this is a significant difference in the sense of the age of our users. If you looked at those coming in for treatment in 05, you would see that um, over th three out of every four public treatment emits 
were over the age of 35 in 2005. We saw a very old cohort of meth users coming in for treatment. If you look at those numbers today, look at the percentages now between the ages of 25 and 34, and those over the age of 35, they're nearly equal. So we have a, a significant trend toward younger users of methamphetamine in Metro Atlanta. The, the race and ethnicity of these users have changed somewhat uh, in doing some of our ethnographic work and talking to users and dealers across Metro Atlanta. More recently, they would describe there being a much more diverse group of users. Um, fascinating work that we've done at Georgia State is to do focus groups with, with MSM men who are users of methamphetamine. All of them got uh, introduced to the drug, at least in this focus group, through a white sexual partner. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and looking at the routes of administration from a public health perspective, and this may tap into some of the, uh, the increases in um, HIV, ser uh, seroconversion in Metro Atlanta, but if you look at the, the percentages of those coming into treatment for smoking has decreased, but what's alarming is that the rate of injectors coming in for primary treatment has doubled uh, from 05 to 17. And when you consider that the purity rates have gone from nearly 70% to 91%, that's also uh, very problematic from a public health perspective. So folks are injecting much higher, much more pure uh, uh, types of methamphetamine. And, and that's consistent with what Jim shared earlier. But not only are we seeing injection increase, purity rates increase, we're seeing the price both at the wholesale and the retail level decreasing significantly. Um, it's about, uh, anywhere from a half to uh, to about a, a, a two thirds of the price uh, at the retail level for a gram of methamphetamine. And finally, um, some of the same trends that we're seeing in Texas as well as across the country is that not only are we seeing um, more folks use and go into treatment for methamphetamine but we're seeing a lot more individuals. This is across the state of Georgia, not just met, uh, Metro Atlanta. Um, we're seeing more individuals die with, uh, um, with meth on board at the time of death. And you can see there uh, the rate, the, uh, the increase of methamphetamine compared to both cocaine and heroin. Uh, and those are very consistent with some of the other data that uh, we've seen presented earlier this afternoon. I think that may be my last one. Uh, thank you very much. So thank you, Brian, and we'll go on to our last speaker, Dr. Lynn Brecht now. So just a brief look at trends uh, for methamphetamine use and consequences in Los Angeles. My summary I'm presenting first, we see increasing trends in Los Angeles County across several indicators of drug use and consequences. And in addition to these increasing trends, for most indicators, the actual numbers or percentages are higher for methamphetamine than for other drugs. We have reports from law enforcement about the wide availability of methamphetamine. The regional head of the DEA indicates that methamphetamine trafficking is the region's uh, top drug enforcement issue and we see low prices for methamphetamine. Both wholesale and retail prices have decreased over the past decade uh, to the point where in 2018, the prices were about a sixth of those prices in 2008. We see in this slide, look at the bright green line for methamphetamine that there is an increasing percentage of drug seizures tested and reported to the National Forensic Laboratory Information System that have tested positive for methamphetamine. Methamphetamine accounts for nearly half of those drug reports from seized items. I've included some of the other drugs on this graph just to provide some context for interpreting the methamphetamine numbers. Admissions to treatment have also been increasing for methamphetamine since 2012, following some decreases that lasted from 2005 to 2011. Um, 
And methamphetamine now for 2017, the most recent data that I was able to get, um, are again the largest percent of admissions compared to other substances. These admissions for methamphetamine are for a diverse group of clients. The right-hand bar shows the gender distribution for 2017, the left-hand bar for 2008, to give a sense of whether demographics have shifted over several years for these methamphetamine treatment admissions. We do see a slight increase in the percentage of females um, ac across this period, but we still have slightly more males than females coming in for treatment admissions. The ethnic distribution has shifted toward a higher percentage of Hispanics and other ethnicities with a decrease in non-Hispanic whites. This is somewhat similar to the population shift, but Hispanics are overrepresented among treatment admissions compared to their percentage of the actual population. In terms of age, the largest proportion of methamphetamine admissions is in the 26 to 45. year age category with a slice. Medical examiner toxicology data show increases in the number of cases in which methamphetamine has been detected. Essentially, these are decedents with drugs on board, not drug, not necessarily methamphetamine related deaths. But we see similar trends when we look at methamphetamine overdose related deaths. This is from a report put out by Los Angeles County this month. And again, showing increases in number of methamphetamine deaths, the light blue bars, and the percent of drug deaths that methamphetamine represents. That's the gray line. We also see generally increasing trends for methamphetamine in Los Angeles County in terms of the calls to the California Poison Control System. After a slight decrease in 2016 and 17, 2018 again showed an increase. Methamphetamine constitutes actually a relatively small proportion of these reports, less than 5%, and that all illicit drugs together constitute about 14% of poison control calls. And we also see an increase for methamphetamine related hospitalizations. These are the pink bars on this graph. And for methamphetamine related emergency department visits. That's the set of blue bars on this graph. In addition, I wanted to emphasize a bit further the implications of these increases. Um, methamphetamine abuse, as you've heard, is a chronic problem. It's characterized by relapse, often with a considerable lag between first use of methamphetamine and admission to treatment. In a long-term follow-up study of 350 methamphetamine users treated in the Los Angeles treatment system in 1996, out of every 10 entering treatment, only six were still methamphetamine abstinent after one month following discharge from treatment, four were meth abstinent at one year post-treatment, three at two years post-treatment, two at five years post-treatment, and continuing to only one still methamphetamine abstinent at 13 years. Of course, individual patterns of use differ across users, often with multiple periods of use and abstinence. In this study, looking at any one month in the 13 years post-treatment where they were observed, 15 to 40% of the sample were using methamphetamine. So that means that many weren't and many were. 
Okay. All right. Thank you very much, everyone, for your presentations. That was very helpful. You were full of a wealth of information, which I'm sure has engendered a lot of thought and discussion amongst our viewers. And several of them have submitted questions for us. So we're going to transition now to our Q&A. And our first question is from a colleague in San Francisco who asks, what role are prescribed or diverted pharmaceutical stimulant treatments for ADHD, like Adderall, playing in the current stimulant epidemic? I used to follow that in the prescription drug monitoring, but I, I haven't anymore. I'm so overwhelmed by ice that... Okay, Jim, I think maybe you had a thought. Yeah, uh, actually we're seeing among the highest levels of uh, Adderall and uh, particularly Adderall uh, a, a misuse. Uh, still popular on college campuses is the so-called study drug, uh, often referred to as Addies. But we've seen a rather significant increase um, in uh, levels of attention deficit disorder misuse medications from issues. Okay, thank you. So I'll go on to our next question, which comes from a colleague who asks if the methamphetamine is in liquid form, is it still picked up as a drug seizure? Yeah. Yes. Yes, it would show up, for instance, in Nipplis, right? Okay, and so our next question is directed to Atlanta, and that comes from a colleague who asks, with the doubling of meth use by injection in Atlanta, have you seen an increase in HIV and hepatitis C? We have seen uh, an increase in HIV infections among meth users, uh, as well as hep C infections. Uh, the the uh, we we saw we started seeing a significant increase in about three years ago when we started seeing the injection trends go up. Um, approximately three years ago, we only saw about fourteen percent, fifteen percent of our uh, treatment emissions injecting, and then within about a eighteen month period, we saw an increase of about six to seven percent. And we, we're doing some focus groups with users. Uh, they cited. Um, the um, the fact that uh, the access to shooting lounges in the city of Atlanta for meth uh, increased uh, both like in hotels, in private residences, um, and uh, decreased stigma related to um, injection drug use um, starting about three, two, two and a half years ago in some of our focus group data. We have seen increases in HIV rates uh, I want to be very careful about that, though, because overall, um, HIV rates in Atlanta have stabilized or gone down slightly. Um, we think that has to do some with um, individuals that have access to PrEP, um, but among drug-using populations and doing some, uh, uh, in some discussions I've had with medical professionals, with HIV testing um, nonprofits in the city, that we have seen increases just in the last two years uh, uh, of HIV seroconversions related to meth use. All right. Thank you, Dr. Dew. So we have a question now from somebody who's looking for some advice from our speakers. So hopefully some of you will have some information for her. And she asks, are we aware of any community strategies that are effective for addressing the meth resurgency? Anybody have any thoughts on that? Well, you can have some more time to think about that too, of course. And I'll just let everyone know that we will be making copies of all of our presenters' slides today and a complete recording of this webinar available on the NDUS website, ndus.org. So look for that there along with the recordings of our prior webinars as well. I don't know, Erin? Yep. We did a survey of 200 and something meth users in treatment. Those people are quite impaired. They've had all kinds of traumatic um, life events. And I'm not real sure that some kind of a community 
campaign would re- other than, than pushing the use of PrEP or something, um, most of the women we interviewed had serious problems, and the men did too. So it's not just stop using meth. I, I, I think it's a much deeper problem. Eva. Many have been abused as children. Um, okay. Thank you. I'm going to move on to our next question, which is about overdose death data from a viewer who asks if the meth overdose data presented, is it meth only, or does it just mean that meth was one of the drugs in their system? In the national data, it's listed as uh, psychostimulant uh, uh, deaths, but the overwhelming majority of those are methamphetamine. Okay, the chart I showed specified what was meth and what was tramadol and what was fentanyl. You can do that if you can get into the literals, which are the uh, the details on the death, but you can't do that through just the normal CDC data. In the in the death data in, in the death data in Atlanta, it or excuse me in Georgia, it's uh, specific specified for methamphetamine on board at the time of death. Not the cause of death, but just on board at the time of yeah. death. And that's for Los Angeles as well. When I look at toxicology data, that is drug on board at the time of death, it is specified as methamphetamine. And many of those with methamphetamine have other drugs on board as well. All right, thank you. I'll also suggest to everyone just a, a reminder, we did release through NDUS a special report on methamphetamine. So if you're interested in more information about how the national trends and the site trends we discussed today compare or how they compare to some of the other NDUS sites, I would encourage you to go look at that report, which is also available on the NDUS website. And just to let you know, part two of this two-part series on illicit Stimulants is coming up on Tuesday, April the 16th at 2 p.m. Eastern. So I hope you will join us then as well. We'll have three speakers that time and we will be posting to the website and Twitter and the NDUS network information about how to register for that. So keep an eye out for that. And in the meantime, I'm going to do just a couple more questions here. And so this one is a question about a graphic, Dr. Dew, that you had in your presentation, one of the maps you had that was showing the existence of the various cartels in operation. Mm -hmm. And this person is wondering if that indicates the effectiveness or ineffectiveness of law enforcement efforts in different areas or what the focus may be on in those places. Yeah, I think it's more of a statement regarding just the the, uh, the significance of Atlanta as a primary distribution hub uh, for the East Coast. Uh, that it's such a convenient location, uh, uh, whether it's 95, I understand 85, whether it's 20, 10. Um, I think it speaks more to just the overall demand for substances and the role that Atlanta plays in uh, the uh, distribution of, of not only meth, but other substances as well. Um, and the fact that there's that much demand for substances, obviously there would not be the cartels there if it wasn't the demand. And so they see, they recognize the importance of having Atlanta as uh, a location for primary functioning for a cartel. Okay, thank you very much. So the next question is many of the indicators on deaths, treatment emissions, and NIFLIS items are reported for single drugs. How much evidence do we have for poly drug use by methamphetamine users? I'm sure you all have some information on that you can share. It seems that all indicators are increasing showing poly substance use as the drug of choice <laughs> is, is combining substances. So we see it in the opioid epidemic, but we see it in cocaine problems, and certainly with methamphetamine. Uh, and it's uh, a key headline of the 21st century in substance use is that we've really moved from drug of choice 
to uh, poly substance patterns. Aaron, to look at the mixtures, if you wanted to know who was coming to treatment, you'd have to cut it by what was the primary drug of abuse, the secondary, and the tertiary. And with the literals in the death data, you can break out all the different drugs, but you have to have the CDC computer to do it. Uh, it's just real hard. Even the poison center data some show, sometimes show what else is on board, and sometimes it doesn't. So these systems were kind of set up for single drug only, and we're beginning to spread out to, to get it more than just drug one. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm going to just pull up for those of you who are hanging in with us a brief poll that we would really appreciate it if you would complete for us to share some information about today's webinar and the kinds of topics you might be interested in in the future. So if you could just take a, a minute or so to just answer those three questions for us, we would absolutely appreciate it. And in the meantime, I will throw out another question and this question is what are the trends in injection versus other routes of use of methamphetamine? Have you guys seen changes in how people are using? No major changes in Los Angeles. Okay. How about in, in Texas or Atlanta? Have, have you guys had a chance to look at that issue? Yeah, I think I've commented on the, uh, the increase in injection drug use, um, especially com uh, compared to the two peaks of 2005 and 2017, um, and the doubling of those coming in for treatment injection and that's consistent with some of our ethnographic work and talking to users um, that injection of the substance is becoming increasingly popular as a route of administration okay thank you and one more question here comes from somebody who would like to know more about how cause of death is determined in regards to polypharmacy. Do any of you happen to know how that works in your areas? Excuse it's me. generally the subjective call of the local medical examiner. Okay. Okay, and wait now, let's, in Texas, we don't have very many medical examiners. So in the rural areas and out in West, you may have justices of the peace signing death certificates who have no medical training. Mm -hmm. So you have very, very good reporting from some states and from some states it's not. Okay. And also to keep in mind that um, I don't, we don't have access to the calls of death data. Uh, state medical examiner's office is very clear that whenever you report this data, you do not report it as calls of death, simply mm -hmm. it on board, that this drug is on board at the time of the analysis the decedent, of the decedent. So very clear, we don't even, I don't even have the access to the calls of death data from the, from the uh, state examiner's office. Okay, thank you very much. That was all very helpful. And let's do one last question here. And this is from a viewer who was interested in the treatment admissions data that you all presented and who asks if there is a particular age range for those going into treatment mentioning methamphetamine. In other words, does it tend to be young adults or older adults? Or what are you seeing in your areas? For Los Angeles, the major age range was 25 to 26 to 45. Okay, thank you. All right, well, so for those of you who are still thinking about the cause of death and how someplace like the CDC might confirm it, I would encourage you to join us in our webinar that's coming up in a couple of months in May, where we'll actually be joined by Dr. Margaret Warner from the CDC, who's going to be talking about the data they've been collecting 
and what they've been looking at and how they've been trying to sort through all of the information to figure out how to categorize things. So again, keep an eye out for our future announcement on the End Use Network for that. And our other webinars that are coming up, thank you to all of you who took the time to complete our poll. We appreciate the information and we're glad that you found this webinar useful and we look forward to seeing you for part two and hope you will join us again for our discussion on cocaine. So thank you very much everyone and we will see you next time.